we're going to call this series Truly Tramming. There's no such thing as Truly Tramming. The only thing we're really doing is getting our table squared to the headstock less than what our indicator can read. And if you're using a 10 thousandths indicator, you got quite a bit of work ahead of you. Um, with a thousandths indicator, which is more than sufficient for many of our milling projects, especially in a home or a small milling shop, um, should be more than sufficient. Um, so, hopefully you bought your, your uh, we'll call it the Siege series from a uh, little machine shop. They're great. Um, had bought numerous stuff from them. Have no complaints. Uh, when there is an issue, they take care of it very, quick, very quickly. So, um, and as far as quality goes, you know it's not the the highest quality, but quality versus price is very good. So, I've got no complaints there. Um, so hopefully you've got your mill. Obviously, your first step, as highlighted in probably any instruction manual, is to take it apart clean it, become familiar with it. Um, if any of the parts aren't coming apart correctly, you know, take a second look at it. Don't force anything. Um, once you get it all taken apart, you know, um, Mineral Spirits works real good for cleaning it. Um, there's a few other things you're going to need. Sorry, y'all caught me during a smoke break. And what I would recommend, so you want your mineral spirits, a whole mass of paper towels, uh, some toothbrushes. I'm not going to show you my toothbrushes, but you know what they all look like. Small files. I usually use a six inch single cut. They seem to work pretty good. You're not trying to change the dynamics of the metal. You're just simply cleaning it up a little bit. Uh, another thing you're going to need are scrapers. This one's actually a homemade one. Just some tool steel stuffed in a melted into a screwdriver handle. Uh, you can also buy a reasonably decent um, scraping set for pretty cheap. Uh, another good one that I like. This is actually one of my favorite tools. and It's just an old triangle file. Hopefully you can all see that. And it's been cut down. If you do make something like this you can use a regular grinder. My suggestions with that, my computer just crapped out on me. I'm going to need to show you guys some pictures here in a minute. And it wants me to retype my password. Go figure. Uh, where's that? Oh, if you do use a regular grinder, I would suggest um, keeping it cool, taking it very slowly, keep dipping it in water. Uh, if you can set up some way to drip water on your wheel while you're doing it, that's even better. If you have a tool grinder, lucky you. Um, you don't want to get it too hot though, you're gonna, you'll ruin the temper of the metal and then your file scraper will be absolutely useless. So keep that in mind if you decide to make one. Another thing you're going to need, a razor blade. I prefer old razor blades for this type of task. You don't have to deal with the super sharp edge. You can hold them a little bit better without worrying about cutting yourself. Several reasons. They work great. So. When you have your mill completely apart and you've already, you know, your first steps, rubbing it down with mineral spirits, WD-40, whatever you decide to use, little machine shop's great because you can pretty much wipe the grease off. They don't use that Cosmoline crap. Um, but I would still suggest just, you know, cleaning it real good with with uh, mineral spirits. doesn't hurt anything. Um, you know, some things you're going to want to watch for is, you know, there's some paint. You're going to want to remove any of that. This is actually the second time my mill's been apart. I kind of skipped out on that a little bit the first time. Just because yeah, I figured that the, the waves would wear it off. What really happened is it created a tight spot on both ends of my Y-axis. So I've since went back through, scraped out all that off, and it runs a lot smoother. You know, simple fact is just do it right the first time, be tedious, and it's going to relieve a lot of headaches down the road. Uh, another thing I got going on here, as you can see, I'm running the razor backwards across the edges. <coughs> I also do it on 
these edges on my Gibbs, pretty much any corner surface. Um, little Machine Shop's mill was actually excellent as far as um, bird edges and sharp edges. Uh, they seem to have uh, gave it a little bit more love at the factory than a lot of the other products you will find out on the market. So that's not one of the biggest issues. But, you know, to me, I don't like sharp edges. If you're getting into machining, you shouldn't like sharp edges either. It doesn't hurt to just... You know, you can even run a flat file over it real lightly. You're not trying to change the dynamics. As I said, you just simply deburn it, making things smooth, run a little bit smoother. You know, I do it on my Gibbs too. I'll put just a slight taper on the end of the Gibbs and it'll cause them to slide better is the theory. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, so when you got it all apart, I take the base part of the table. <clears throat> if you guys can see this. A nice little squiggly line there. There's some uh, X's over here, up in the corners. Not on this part. You know, I first these I'd suggest you know take your hand scraper, your razor blade, and scrape those real good. Make sure you get all the uh, whatever's on there, grime from the factory. Um, you know, so there's sometimes some paint over spray. There's could be anything on there really. You know, just get them scraped down real good and then that part with the little squiggly line in the X's as you've seen just on the outside edges here and then this whole area I actually took a little bit rougher file than the uh, the six inch single cut and relieved it just a hair I'm not talking I mean to the point where it's barely perceivable with the naked eye but that way what's going on here is when I mount my mill I know that my mill is going to be touching on those four corners say there's a flaw in the table or whatever you know a piece of metal embedded up there that's sticking up just a hair um a knot who knows i don't know what you're mounting it to but you know if you get rid of that just a hair it gives you you'll know exactly where your machine's mating to the table which is always great so as i was saying I don't believe these were Gibbs. I don't remember what these Gibbs were off of. I believe these were off of my lathe. I'm going to do a whole segment on that because, well, you'll see why. So, um, as a disclaimer, I should have said that anything you see in this shop, I don't necessarily recommend just because I own it. doesn't mean it's a great product. Um, if it's a great product, I'll tell you it's a great product. If I don't say anything about it, just assume it's here because... That's what I have. So this is an example of, as you can see, there's some nice little uh, boogers on the end of the gibbs there. So, you know, you take your file, you knock those off, leave a little bit of taper instead. You know, you don't need much, just a tiny taper. Just so that way if there is any issues, it'll at least slide better. <coughs> so with all that done, you know, you start putting your table together. Make sure you lube it as you go. You know, don't be afraid. Your first lube, definitely don't be afraid to slather it on. You can wipe it off the outsides when you're done if it looks ugly. But you want to make sure it completely covers all your gib surfaces, all your sliding surfaces. And, um, you know, that's the first step. Choose your spot to put it. I suppose I should... We'll address this in this issue. Um, with all my heavier equipment not like a mini mills heavy but it is sitting on a table uh this is technically my setup got some old um that's a bottom off of a treadmill actually and it's some pretty heavy duty stuff but if you'll see i got bolt holes that actually go through my metal and that is where my mill will be bolted down on the same thing with the lathe i specifically uh, I don't know if you can see this, but I specifically built the table so there's metal underneath where the lathe actually rests as opposed to just being a thick piece of wood or whatever else ends up under there. So once you decide your spot, put your mill on there and start putting it back together. 
um, I might as well get into the issue of bolting it down. If you do bolt it down, when you bolt down your base, it doesn't have to be super snug. I mean, you want it snug, but you don't have to crank those bolts down to get it to stay. I mean, the purpose of the bolts, the mill will stay under its own weight. I can guarantee you that. The purpose of the bolts is just pretty much for your own protection. You know, say you take a fall and grab the mill to support you. Last thing you need is it sliding off the table on top of you when you're going down. So, hopefully you're not taking a fall, but it could happen. The bolts are there to keep it on the table, not necessarily to make it so it won't ever come off the table. So you don't have to snug those down more than just, you know, snug. Apparently I like that word. Um, so yeah, after you do that, you know, put together all your stuff. Might as well dress the Gibbs real quick. Uh, put together, you know, everything that goes for what it's going to need, at least for the base for now. We'll get into the column here in the next episode probably. Um, tighten up your Gibbs. I like to use just a Allen head that adapts to a um, breaker bar or a socket. I don't actually use the socket. I just use the Allen head by itself. You know, I get a good grip on it. I crank all my, my Gibbs in the first time as tight as I can get them by hand. And then I'll, I'll usually leave the middle ones tight and I'll loosen the outside too because your outside two are going to be the most important on any equipment you own. So you leave the inside tight, it holds your gib plate in place. I'll loosen the outside two until they're completely free and then I'll just take my hand and I'll hold the, the uh, Allen you know, rather loose and I'll just turn them back in until there's a attention enough to let the Allen slip through my fingers and then I'll twist my uh, bolts down to where they touch and then I'll take my wrench and I'll just barely snug the bolts on. You don't have to crank them on tight either just a nice little snug so that way it pulls pressure back on that screw and, and causes it all to bind together. You know there's no need to actually reef them on there. It's not going to do any bit of good other than it might turn your screws a little bit more and cause uh, a headache trying to get your gibbs adjusted once I got the two outside done I'll do the exact same with the two centers I'll give it a test with the hand wheel and if everything slides correctly it means you got everything lubricated right and your gibbs are adjusted fairly decent um, to ensure what your gibbs are adjusted I didn't actually this picture I'm going to show you usually I'll take my y-axis and I'll go all the way over as far as it'll go to one side and then I'll set up my indicator. This was just, I pretty much, this isn't me actually doing the testing. I just set it up so you can get a general idea. And so I just stuck it onto my headstock and ran it down. Usually I'll, you know, put a plate on the table where I know the indicator is not going to move. Good heavy steel plate and put a magnetic base there. And then I'll just put my indicator on the, the uh, edge of the table. Um, as I said, this is just a testing. I didn't actually, you know, so it's my table still centered. I was just showing you as an example as where in reality I'd have it all the way over. Um, when you do this and you have it all the way over and you can put your indicator on there, what you do is you'd lock one of your gibs either way, you know, your Y or your X axis, eh, X axis. It doesn't matter which one first. Lock one of the gibs, reach over, grab the table. And hopefully your base is bolted down or it's going to be kind of a pain in the butt. And try to give it a little bit of a wiggle. You know, I, I like about a thousandth of an inch when the table's all the way extended to the right or the left is usually more than enough. It gives it just enough freedom to move freely. You know, there's no pressure behind my hand wheels or anything like that. But yet the table is tight enough to where you're going to get a nice, beautiful finish on whatever you're machining. Once you've done one side, loosen up that gib and then tighten the gib on the other axis and you know leave it all the exact same setup and do it again. And by doing that you'll actually, you know, it'll show you any play in either gib. You don't have to move your indicator or anything. You can just one spot, both gibs, and done. Easy peasy. The other thing before you bolt your machine down, I would recommend um, leveling it. 
whatever you're going to use. I use my protractor level because that's probably the tool that I would use most on my machine. So if your machine's level to, let's say, your protractor and you want to set up an angle block and you don't have a whole bunch of different angle blocks or a sign plate or anything like that, you can use your protractor in your vise with the spirit level and get a pretty close pretty close uh, approximation to the angle that you want depending on what kind of uh, level you're using. I mean if you're using a, a $10 hardware store combination square then um, yeah it's anybody's guess how accurate it's going to be but if you have a good you know peck or star it or browns and sharp and you've tested it and made sure that it's level you know more than likely the graduations on it are going to be fairly accurate so that's the way to go you can always probably take it to a machinist and have him tell you if you know have him you compare it to some of his equipment and tell you if it's a little off but for most of what we're doing that'll get you you know right on and when you do you know if you do need to shim with my table unfortunately um my construction isn't that great either the floor is unlevel or my brain's unlevel but i was actually just using a speed square or a um not a speed square a torpedo level to level my table and when compared to my protractor it's not even on the same plane so um yeah so i ended up having to shim my machine a little bit and when you do do that you know try to shim it equally well, don't try to. I would say shim it equally. Um, you know, if what you do to one side in the back, do to the other side in the back, and to the front, etc. Um, you know, the last thing you want to do is get uneven shims in there and put some tension on it. And that's the other reason I'm saying don't torque your your table down to whatever you have it built on. Just snug it up because say. You know, you are using a piece of wood and there's a low spot and you torque it down good and tight and it causes your bed to kind of twist a little bit and then you end up with all this tension through your gibbs and through your table and you can't figure out why. And it's because, you know, the piece of wood or whatever you're bolting to, and that's the other reason I use metal, is causing your machine to twist. So just snug it up so it won't fall off the counter. And if you have to, shim it up. And that's about it. Um... So I'm going to stop this now. I think I'm going to go, well, I don't think I'm going to go. I'm going to go grab some dinner. And uh, next episode, I will discuss chewing up the column. And uh, eventually, we'll get around to the point where I show you how to square the table to as close to zero as you can get it. Um, hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully, it... Uh, relieved a little bit of stress on your mind about exactly what to do setting it up um yeah i will see you again in a few